Okay, now you've got your DNA separated by size on the agarose gel, as you can see here. When you add your tritiated or P32 labeled probe onto the gel, it should hybridize with specific fragments or parts of fragments inside the gel. And then you can detect it using the radio labeled P32, which is located on the probe. Hi friends, my name is Carter. I'm a PhD bioengineer and founder of Sygen.com. My goal with this channel is to teach you new biotechniques every single week so that you become a more well-rounded scientist and have a lot of different techniques under your tool belt. And you can take the information that you learn in these YouTube videos along with free protocols that you can find on Sygen.com and actually apply all of this knowledge in your lab for your research. Make sure you click that like button and you subscribe to the channel if you're interested in learning new biotechniques every single week. And now it's time to learn some Southern blotting from Prashant, a new guest speaker that we've got here on our YouTube channel. Hey everybody. So today's video is going to be about Southern blotting. So just some background information. Southern blotting is a method used to identify specific DNA sequences in a given sample of DNA. For example, if I wanted to identify the a, C, G, T, T, G, C, A sequence in, say, a given sample of DNA, I would use a method of southern blotting to do so. There are also northern blotting and western blotting, which is used to identify RNA and protein sequences, respectively. But in this case, we're just going to be going over southern blotting, and it is only used to identify DNA sequences. Southern blotting can be broken down into six major steps. They are extracting DNA fragments. The second step is gel electrophoresis and denaturing. Three is blotting. Four is probe labeling. Five is hybridization and washing. And six is detection of the DNA fragment. The DNA sequence that we are looking for, in this case, it is the A, C, G, T, T, G, C, A. This sequence is possibly going to be within our cell's nucleus. And to get access to it, we're gonna to have to use a solution composed of these enzymes called protease and RNase. And what these enzymes essentially do is they break down the cell material, the RNA in the cell and the protein in the cell. And what essentially happens is the nucleus and the cell membrane split open or disintegrate, essentially break apart and release the DNA that's inside. After this step, to actually separate the DNA from the rest of the cell material, we're going to have to use a centrifuge. And that pushes the DNA down at the bottom of the test tube here. It kind of leaves the cell material, the junk, at the top. And what we can essentially do is just filter out this cell material. And we're just left with full strands of DNA at the bottom of our test tube. Now, normally, it's preserved in ethanol, some kind of alcohol. and See, after we separate the DNA from the cell material, we add something called a restriction enzyme. A restriction enzyme basically cuts up the DNA into these fragments, which can be easily read. Our next step is gel electrophoresis and denaturing. Now, gel electrophoresis is a fairly popular laboratory method. Its purpose is to essentially organize the DNA by its molecular weight. So the longer the fragment is, relatively it will be separated than the relatively shorter ones or smaller ones and how this works is there is a charge potential over this agarose gel so that's the gel that we hold the dna in and this gel allows the dna to move through it and when we apply a charge potential to it the smaller ones sort of drift towards the bottom towards the positive side because dna is generally negatively charged but the bigger ones these ones right here they kind of stay at the top because they're too big to drift out so by the end of gel electrophoresis we should have an agarose gel that contains dna in it organized by its molecular weight like this one important thing to keep note of is our dna is currently double stranded and we want it to be single stranded because later on in the process we're going to be finding our targeted DNA fragment by attaching a complementary one. Hopefully this is our 
A, C, G, T, T, G, C, A. Hopefully that's our DNA fragment. But to essentially separate them and make them single-stranded from double-stranded, what we're gonna have to do is use an alkali solution to denature the DNA. Now for the fun part, which is blotting. The purpose behind blotting is to basically move this DNA, this DNA right here, from the agarose gel to the membrane. And the reason we do that is because if you ever picked up agarose gel, it's really, really, really fragile. It'll pretty much crack, break, tear at pretty much anything you do to it. So to get a better medium to work through, we transfer the DNA from the agarose gel to this membrane. Now, normally this membrane is made of nitrocellulose or nylon, depends on you know where you buy it from, all that. But the essential process is gonna be the same either way. To do the transfer, we're gonna need a couple materials. We are going to need a buffer solution. This buffer solution is essentially used to pretty much use capillary action and essentially move the water up through this pile that we have right here, up through this blotting paper, up through this gel, and through the membrane. And as it transfers through the gel, it lifts the DNA up with it and attaches it to this nitrocellulose membrane. And basically how we do this procedure is we have to have a basin to start with, and then we add our buffer. And on top of our buffer, we put a sponge there to provide a support. And we lay on blotting paper. And we have to be careful to make sure that the blotting paper actually does dip into this buffer so that the capillary action will help push the buffer up through the paper. So after we add our blotting paper, our first layer of blotting paper, we put on our gel. The same agarose gel right here, we just gently put on top. And on top of that, we put on our nitrocellulose membrane. And on top of our membrane, we add another layer of blotting paper. On top of that, we add a couple tissues. And on top of that, we add our weight. So essentially, after you do this, what should happen is the buffer solution moves up through the blotting paper, through the gel, through the membrane, and it kind of soaks into the tissues. But as it moves up, the DNA again moves from the gel to the membrane. So our next step is probe labeling. A probe in this use case will be a homologous single-stranded DNA, like the one shown over here. Now remember, our original DNA sequence that we were looking for was an A, C, G, T, T, G, C, A sequence. So it is going to be somewhere in the gel in a single-stranded position just like this because we denatured it in our gel electrophoresis step. So what we're going to have to do is basically use this probe as kind of a seeker in a sense to come out and find our single-stranded DNA sequence to essentially mark it and verify that it actually exists in the sample that you've given. The type of probe that you choose is dependent on a variety of factors like how sensitive you want it to be, how you want it to be identified. It could be through x-ray, radioactivity, fluorescence, a myriad of other methods. But for this time, we're going to be using an x-ray probe. And how this works is basically after we've already binded it to our single-stranded DNA sequence in our gel, it'll become a double-stranded with the probe attached to it. That probe will have markers that when you shine an x-ray light on it, it'll be used as like a marker of sorts to actually verify that it exists in our sample. The next step is hybridization and washing. Because we know that if our probe can be detected, we can now set it loose into our membrane right here and essentially how we do that is your probe should be suspended in this solution and you would basically put the solution into a basin and dip the membrane into that and let it soak for about two hours it depends how long it takes for your probe to actually hybridize or bind to the single-stranded dna in our membrane and form that double strand so you can go through and identify where it is after we give the membrane enough time for hybridization to occur it will be washed with a series of buffers so that all the probes are kind of just washed away if they are unattached. So it'll erase these right here, wash them out, essentially just like that. And towards the end, we are going to be left with our membrane, the DNA strands on the membrane, and the probe attached to those single-stranded DNA. And we are going to be ready for our final step. Finally, we have reached the final stage of detection. So this stage is actually fairly simple and is exactly how it sounds like. You simply follow the method of detection used by your probe to reveal the DNA fragments if they exist in your membrane. 
But if you go back to the previous slide, we actually learned that the probe we're using can be detected when we shine an X-ray onto our membrane. If there is any of the probes left attached to the membrane, then you will be able to identify them. In this case, they are identifiable. Because we have the TGCAA CGT fragment, which is right here, the probe is bonded to it. And by using the X-ray, you can identify it because it exists in the sample. So it was a pleasure explaining the process of Southern blotting to all of you. Of course, you can click on the subscribe button down below to support us and view more of our laboratory technique explanations. But for now, thank you for viewing our video and we hope you came out of it learning something new.